you know, I was in law school, dropped out, like got a job and it was like a startup. I was the first wave of 40 reps hired. We got, we got a equity piece in the company. The company did really well. Um, you know, we had this equity piece that I didn't know about and, you know, a year into it, year and a half, like the company had like this big milestone that crossed the billion dollar market cap. And Welcome back everybody to Be The Trader. Today I have a very special guest and you know what's unique about the CS is a lot of you guys and gals have been saying, you know, you've been really focused on the short side and lately we've been getting a lot more long bias traders. And today I have a very special long bias trader who's a position trader and who also positions himself very well in GameStop, buying it in like, I think it was the sixes before it ran, which is just wild. Could you imagine? And he sized in the way he would want to do it because he didn't know it was going to go up that high. But I have for you Paso, a.k.a. I believe it's P. Milok, right? P. Millie. P. Millie. P. Millie. P. Millie. And that's my fault on Twitter. So if you don't know him by Paso, you know him by P. Millie on Twitter. And if you don't know that, then you need to go follow him now because he usually tweets a little bit about you know what he's thinking and so yeah, forth. Yeah. So welcome to the show, Paso. Thanks for Happy being here. Happy to be here, man. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, dude. You know, when I found out that you bought... GameStop at like six dollars. I was like, this guy's a joke. No way. <laughs> I was like, there's no way you bought that six dollars. First off, we'll get into your background, but I, I had to jump on this right away before yeah. we get into that. What walk me through that? So correction, game I was buying GameStop in the fours, but I was buying that into six. So as a position trader, a long swing trader. I, you know, my, my process is based on finding names, beating down, you know, near 52 week lows. Um, I typically look for just like a, a simple, um, scan 50, 60, 70, up to hundred uh, percent, divergence from the 200 day moving average. So you're talking like extremely beaten down names and GameStop just happened to be on, uh, on the scan. And th- what's interesting about GameStop is once it came up, um, if you look at the chart and you see how long it held in that four level, I mean, it was like months, May, August, I mean, May, June, July, it, it had a base of about four bucks for months. And we, even back then the short percentage was like 70, 80, it kept ramping up like 90, even in the fives up to six bucks, the short float was still about 90, 96%. So I'm thinking to myself, well, if the short float is this high and they haven't been able to break it down, it typically that's, that's a, to me, a clear sign. It's going to go the other way. Now it had the initial move. Um, I sold some, it came back and I added again, like, so I was adding it around six when it, it, it had an ER miss and then it dipped to about six fifty. So I added back what I sold and then just kind of, you know, trended back up slowly. And then, you know, after that, the uh, Ryan Cohen news came in and, you know, that just shot it up and uh, it just, you know, it ran in, in the twenties and came, like just under 20 came back. I added it again. So yeah, man, it was just one of those, I mean, back then there's no way, I mean, no matter, you know, what anybody says, it's, it's, imp- it's like a total black swan event. Like, nobody could have foreseen it coming. And when it started to pick up, you know, it, it broke 20 and I, I'd sized in pretty well. Um, and it broke 20 that day. It was like 22 and it just went to 30, you know, 35. And honestly, honestly, like the majority of my position, I was done like in the mid, mid to high thirties. And then it never looked back. And I, you know, it's funny to think about like seeing where, where it went after and like me not having barely any size left. But at the end of the day, like those moves, those major, major moves, like you give back so much. And I was up like five, 600%, you know? So I just wasn't willing to risk giving any money back. Unfortunately, I did what I always tell you guys to do is stop trading your PL. you know? And I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm looking at like where, what the chart is like it's telling me, where do I think it's going to go? And I just happened to look and, you know, the money just kind of took a grasp of me. I'm like, you know what? I'm not giving any of this back. And When I think about it now that it's all said and done, it would have been really hard for me to hold even up to up to 100, you know, Um, given the size I had, given the move, 
I mean, yeah, it went three, four, five, and here we are, it's climbing back into threes, but you know, you're only, I mean, you're so tunnel visioned when you're in the trade in, you know, you, you look at the PL on the chart and it, it's so hard to look at everything else. But now, like I said, when it's all said and done, yeah, I missed out a, on a, maybe another 50, 60%, but there's just no way to hold. And the guys that made it up to two, 300, they were probably buying the forties and fifties, you know? So I, I walked away clean. I took, I took a couple of weeks off just to kind of like recoup. Cause you know, even after a big, big loss or a big win, you want to like mentally, like kind of gather yourself and, and, you know, you're not overconfident jumping into the next play. And, but yeah, it's, it's crazy to think about, but um, I actually, you know, I do a fair amount of fundamental analysis too, with my plays. So in as, you know, as I'm positioning myself, I, with decent size, like I need to make sure that this isn't like a JC Penny or a Sears or a Hertz. Um, GameStop, you know, had five, 600 million in, in cash. They, they do five, $6 billion in revenue a year. Like they might've had another couple of years left, or as people call a cigar, butt trade left, but you know, the fact that people are calling for bankruptcy, I mean, I just didn't see it. And when you, when you align the technicals with the fundamentals for me, you know, that the short float and whatever was happening with, with the share structure was just, you know, the gasoline to this flame that was getting ignited and, you know, Cohen stepped in and, you know, Hedge Eye came in with their top pick of, of, uh, was it 2020 or 2021? And I mean, it's just, man, it what what a move, but <laughs> it's, it's still, it's crazy to see, you know, like being involved so early and then seeing what it did after. But that's amazing, dude. Yeah. What's, what's cool is you said a couple of things and that is the idea about even when a big win or a big loss, how you might want to take a step back. Can you explain why that's important? I've, you know, in my career early on, um, after a big win the next day, I mean, I would do a good job of, of like knowing the dollar amount behind it and just kind of voiding that out, whether, you know, it was like, Oh, I just, my best, my best day this month or best win I've ever had or whatever. Like I would forget about the dollar amount, go in and like, just get super aggressive the next day, you know? And then I would give 20, 30, 50% of that win back on potentially one trade. Cause you're just, you're overconfident. Like you, you think that somehow your prior trade has correlation to this next one, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's a whole new trade. It's, it's a whole new setup. Um, and you just, you, you're going in swinging when you don't really know what the outcome of this trade is going to be. The opposite side of that is when you lose 20 or 30% on a trade, all you can think about is that loss. Right. And then now you got to climb back, you know, and, you got to make it back. And it's all you think about. So you project that loss on the next trade. So you might see, okay, well, I have an opportunity to make, you know, 20% here. And, you know, you portray that image on the chart and mentally what what's not even there. So the best thing to do is just disconnect. And I mean, you know, for me, I, I've, I've been on both sides of it. You know, I've, I've, I've made a lot and I've come back and I've, I've lost, you know, and I've given a lot of it back. And also on, on, you know, when you win, it's, I think it's best to just let it digest, like kind of come down for a little bit and then just ease back. And I think that's what, you know, as, as I've gotten more experience in the last couple of years, I've, I've learned, I mean, I took a month off, honestly, I didn't work all of February. I just like, yeah, I had a couple of really big wins, uh, aside from GameStop. And I'm like, man, I just need to like, you know, I, and it wasn't really my market. I mean, we've been straight up as I did like a scan, I didn't really see much opportunity for me. So I decided to take a step back. And like let things you know kind of digest and you know it wasn't until this last week week and a half where i really started deploying some money again and luckily you know we got a dip and getting involved with some stuff so yeah i mean that's my long answer to that nice no i appreciate you saying that because a lot of people listening to this are probably thinking that that feeling they're getting as a newbie trader that it's going to go away as you grow up as you, you advance as a trader and you yeah. just highlighted i mean it happens to everyone everyone goes through these kind of things no matter right. where you're at in your career I just like that you said that. What do you normally do? You just take it off completely always like that? Or, or is it like usually like a couple of days? Just curious. Well, I, I day trade too. Um, okay. I, I always have swings on as, as I'm just referring to like initiating a new opportunity. So looking, you know, as soon as I get rid of one swing, like jump back into the next one, you know, like just kind of let it, you know, let it digest, 
like let let the market do what it's going to do and then if i have something you know on my radar i'll kind of watch it a little bit more closely maybe get involved a little bit but you know just kind of ease back into it but i've you know i always have a few few positions out and I, I day trade like i said too but i you know the month of february i just kind of took a step back and okay allowed myself some time to, to so so let's go let's take a step back real quick and let's go back to the beginning of your journey so yeah. that, that we kind of already hit the game stop because i know a lot of people are probably like yeah. man what did he do so let, let us go back yeah. What got you started and when did you start in trading? And let's go from there. Yeah. So I started in about 2014. Um, I was uh, I, I was involved with a, a pharmaceutical company that uh, offered an equity piece with some stock options. And that's actually how I found out about the market. You know, I was in law school, dropped out, like got a job. And it was like a startup. I was the first wave of 40 reps hired. We got we got an equity piece in the company. The company did really well. Um, you know, we had this equity piece that I didn't know about and, you know, a year into it, year and a half, like the company had like this big milestone that crossed the billion dollar market cap. And I'm like, what are we celebrating? What's going on here? And I'm like, well, your stock options. And, you know, that's how I found out about it. And that's how I found out about the markets. So I'd made more money in stock than working for like two years. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I quit my job and I started trading. <laughs> that's, that's how, that's how I got into the markets. Damn, that's so, crazy. Okay, yeah. so that was okay. And then, so you just jumped into the markets. You know, how did you learn? Like, what what happened? Like, you just uh, jumped in. Did you do well the first year when you did that? Like, how did it happen? Man, man, it was brutal. I lost like half my money in six months. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. Didn't have a. You know, I quit my job. I just thought I was gonna like. I was like, well, this is easy, and I'll figure it out. And I had a you know a decent chunk of money. I'm like, well, you know, I pay my bills and use some money to trade and. That just went. I mean, I was losing every day, two, three grand every single day. I'm like, man, I couldn't make trading like big bucks. too as a new trader. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I was you know like yeah, I couldn't make a hundred bucks. You know, <laughs> and like every loss is like twenty times that. So um, I had to actually go back and like uh, I had to go back and get a job and like trade part time because I ran out of money. You know, I yep. couldn't pay bills. I couldn't trade. So uh, I had to go back and 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 tr and uh, work. And then I, was, I started, that's how I got introduced to swing trading. And I'm like, I can't watch these positions every day. So I had a sales job and I was out doing sales again. And then, you know, you know, managing my swings. And then slowly I transitioned back, transitioned out of the full-time job. And so back in 2016, I want to say, uh, I had a big, um, I had a big win, like a, a uh, swing, like Jivo was the ticker way, way back. Yep. And uh, I swung it for like four or five X and that was like a huge win at the time. And I was like, all right, I'm ready again. So I quit and I've been, I've been full time ever since. So really, okay. Yeah. So, so how did you pick up swing trading then? I, I'm very curious because it's, I love that you said you, you know, you went through that time of, I know at the time price sucked, but you know, you lost money and you had to go back to work. And then you figured out I could swing trade while I'm working. How did you kind of, did you just kind of teach yourself? Give me an idea of how that happened. Yeah. I saw, I was, um, I've, I've been in Nate's room since, since I started, uh, okay. investors on the ground since 2014. Um, <clears throat> but what I, I think what, what helped me figure out the process was I was obsessed about like where I went wrong, like, and I would start tracking things on a multiple time frame, like, two days, three days, a week, two weeks, three weeks. And before you know it, I had this un inadvertently created this and I still do it to this day. So I, um, I use PowerPoint and I use uh, um, Camtasia to track my trades. And then I, I screenshot like what I did like intraday. And that, that way, like I keep like a, a, a virtual journal or a visual journal for lack of a better word for myself. But when I when I started, all I was doing was just looking at, at charts and then seeing like, OK, this move happened. What happened four or five days before? And then I would just like try to dissect it backwards and see like what caused the move. And then over time, I'm like, well, if I could have gotten in here, I could have sold into this move. So I was just creating this process, you know, inadvertently. And I got to like a swing trade. I'm like, you know what? I'll buy it and I'll, I'll hold it for a couple of days. Then it, it transferred into holding for a week or two. And then, you know, as time goes on, you sprinkle in, you add, you add more tools, you know, you add more moving averages, things like that. So that's basically how I did. I tried to dissect like why moves happened. Yeah. And I just created this process for myself. But in my mind, I was always more focused on risk than the upside. How much was I willing to risk? 
you know, because if, I mean, GameStop's a perfect example. Nobody knows where this thing's going to go. You know, it could go up 50, 100, you know, it could go up 20%. If right. I could manage my downside, that, that was key for me because I'd lost so much money. I'm, you know, like you get burned. You're like, well, how do I protect the downside? How do I minimize my losses? So I figured, you know, if I find a stock that's down 90% on a year, you know, or 95%, like how much selling is there really left? So, you know, over time that just, and like I said, inadvertently created this process for myself and I've been doing the same ever since, you know, as, as I've gotten, you know, more experience, I've just added in every, you know, I you still, I mean, you could be involved with the markets 30, 40, 50 years. You, you still can't say I've got it all figured out. I mean, things change, fundamentals change the way, you know, these, this volatility is just, you know, nobody is, can expect this. Nobody can plan on it. So I've just continued to add things to my toolbox and, and have just like built my process from that. And so what I, what I like what you say is like, you kind of just reverse engineered and you, you looked at moves, you wanted to see how it happened and try to figure out what made it happen and try to figure out where you can position yourself, which is nice. But, but a lot of people are going to hear one thing that you said, and they're going to focus in on, oh, this guy just buys things that are just dying out. And that's what I need to do. So what is something someone needs to look out for? Because I know that's not what you're saying. You know, I know you're specific on what you're looking for, but what's like a, something to look out for, for a new trader who hears a swing trader who just buys things that are beaten down? Yeah. So uh, there's there's uh, multiple indicators that I use. So I use the 200 a lot. That just gives me like the big overall picture, you know, 200s yeah. a year here. So if I find something that's 50 or 100%, you know, oh, divergent from the 200 that like I'm interested. I also use the 50 day moving average and I use a nine exponential. So the nine exponential is like your short term uh, indicator. So typically I like to see the 200 the 50 below the 200 and the nine or potentially the 20. So stacked on one, one on top of the other. When, once a shorter uh, time frame or shorter indicator, like uh, reclaims, price reclaims that indicator, it typically starts to trend up. So those are things that I like to use more specifically to kind of give me a better, better idea of, is this, are these dips gonna hold? Is this trending upward or is this just a quick short cover and a pop is going to fail and it's going to roll over again. So you want to see dips hold. Obviously, like there's more to it, you know, in in in, uh, in detail. But again, it's there's there there are things that that you can use from a technical standpoint that'll help you know kind of guide your trading or you know like um, use as exit points. You know, you could use the hundred, the you know the the fifty or whatever. Because typically, if if the 200 is above the 50 and the price is below the 50, it'll trend back once it reclaims the nine, the nine exponential, just things that I've learned over, over the years. And then if, if the price is coming off lows and failing on the 50, well, shit, you know, you probably should take profits there, you know? Uh, so that, again, those are just, those are just more things in, in, in detail where, where I um, have, have kind of picked up on. What it come when now? I appreciate you sharing that. But what it, when it comes to holding a position because you swing most? That's the majority of what you do. It sounds like when yeah. it comes to holding a position, and let's say it seems like you do love indicators, and which is nice because a lot of people ask me questions about that. And I personally don't use them, so I I want to ask you this because I know people are going to ask this themselves. Is let's say you're using an indicator and. Are you also, are you ignoring like support and resistance trend lines or to help Does that help or come in any kind of sort of play for you to yeah, absolutely. You know, determine I mean, risk and anything like that? Well, of course. Well, I, so if, if I had my ideal chart, um, it would be something that's washed out all of support on the way down because when charts get messy, um, you've got a lot of support in between and that support gets broken. And then it washes out and then, you know, finds new support comes back, whether that's short cover or not, it might roll over. And then, you know, that it breaks that support. So it, it creates like a super messy chart and you've got a lot of resistance on the way up. Yep. So I like something that washes out completely mm -hmm. to all time lows, sets a new base and starts trending off that base because, you know, it, it, it just makes for me, for my eyes, like a much cleaner chart. Mm -hmm. So, um, to, to answer your question, yes, support and resistance is, is very easy to read. You know, you just have to spend time reading charts. And, you know, when you pair up with multiple timeframes, like the hourly, like as a swing trader, with the weekly, you know, and, and when these timeframes align, it makes for a much better move. But like I said, it's the, the indicators are, are there as a guide. They don't, 
you know, they're not like a foolproof system um, where like, you know, this is a, once it crosses here, then you should buy Once it fails here, you should sell. It's not like that. I mean, I'm just saying as, as a, somebody that might just be taking on swing trading, you know, use that as his initial guide and, you know, it, it, it helps, you know, I love that you said that too, because it's, it is a guide and, and it's also clarifying that you need confluence, which is something that's so important. Like you use multiple things in your lineup right. for it to be an ideal you know, position for you to, right. you know, to take, which is interesting. And on top of that, it's, I love that you even clarified like the stocks that just like kind of break, hold support, break, hold support. Like they're going to be a little bit more mm, not clean in terms of so many areas where people can just, you know, cover or, or right. sell right. or short or whatever it may be at that area. Right. So you'd like a more clean chart, which is something that's interesting because if you didn't pick that up when Paso was talking, you need to go rewind that and listen to that again, because he just hit, he just dropped some really good knowledge on when it comes to swing trading. But I, I have a question for you though. Did you just, from my perspective, just talking to you right now, it kind of just sounds like it was pretty easy for you. So was there difficulty in you trying to figure out the swing game? And if there was, what was the most difficult part for you? Man, I still, to this day, um, I, I struggle taking profits on swings, you know, and GME aside, um, there's, it, it took me years to figure out, you know, I was always good at timing the bottom because I, I tracked volume patterns and I, you know, just different, different things, but I struggled so much selling on the way up and giving so much of that move back, you know, like, and that's now I'm like, I'm trained at, and GameStop, perfect example, you know, like you get trained to sell, you know, and, and to me, like I was trained to buy. And I would give, you know, it would take me months, two, three months. I, you know, this, the like setup, the play was perfect. Dips, add everything. And then as soon as it started to go, I, I just wouldn't take profits. And then something would happen and I would give 50% of my PL back or ride things down all the way back to, to flat, you know, or, or even negative. Like I've been involved with swings where I've been up, you know, seven figures and then I end up being down half a mil you know so it it's never it, it's it's never a proven system i mean you can't be perfect in the markets i failed so many times on executing hitting the sell button on the way up cuz i was always so confident and that's sometimes too much conviction in my trades where i'm like i know it's going to get here and then you know you don't want to sell and then it comes back and you're like well shit you know i i just gave back half my pnl I'm not going to sell. And I would add again, you know, and then it just, it, it creates this, this one bad decision just leads to more, you know? And then if you're trading your PL, like I always tell people not to do, it's like, all right, you missed, the, you missed the sell on the first run up and then it washes out and then you sell into the dip instead of adding, you know, like it, so one bad decision, just, it just creates this, this long, uh, you know, it was a long track of just like making more bad decisions. So it took me a long time to get there, but you know, that's, that's where, I would say as, as especially somebody new use the indicators because that's going to be your guide. You know, if you're trading stuff off the bottom, like I do a lot of times, like the, the 200 day or the 50 day, you know, you got a 30, 40, 50% reversion. You know, if it goes into that, sell into it, you know, like the, where the hell are you going to make 20, 30% on the swing? You know, that's, that's nice. That, if you can repeat that five times a year, you know, that's on a 20%, you know, you just doubled your account, you know, and, and I failed to, to, do execute myself, but uh, you know, I, I am always looking for the bigger picture. And, you know, as I'm doing more fundamental stuff too, it's, it, it I've, I've made too many mistakes on just not selling, you know, sometimes si sizing in too soon or, you know, there's, I mean, the list goes on. So by no means am I, am I where I need to be? I'll probably never get there, but you know, you learn on every single trade. Yeah. No, I love that you said that too. Cause you're just showing you're showing everyone that no matter what level you're at, you're constantly working on things. You're constantly yeah. trying to get better. There's always new challenges, maybe at, at a different caliber, right? Like at, at, if you're trading hundred dollars per, you know, hundred dollar risk versus, uh, you know, hundred thousand risk, the caliber, it might be the same issues you're dealing with, but times a hundred thousand, you know, like it's just a little bit more. It's, yeah. The zero is a little bigger. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. just like a lot more pressure. So I get that. And that's probably why you reference don't look at your PL because you mentioned that you did that in GameStop and it kind of got in your head where you're just like, I'm not yeah. going to give this back. Why? 
or how, how what, what made you come to that conclusion? Don't look at your PNL. Like where did that come from? And why is that a rule for you? Because I've, 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 I've made so many mistakes on, you know, you see, okay, like I'm up, I'm up, I'm up a hundred grand, you know, like, and you don't, you stop looking at the chart and then it dips, you know, now you're up 70 or 60. And then now you're like, okay, you know, it just, it changes your decision-making when you're looking at the, the P and L, because if you're up hundred K just use even numbers and all of a sudden you're down, you know, 40%. So you're down now you're up 60. You don't see it as being up 60 K you see it as you just lost 40 grand. So mentally you are now approaching the trade from a totally different perspective, you know, and that's, that's where I just, I try to avoid, especially, you know, when I'm day trading, just don't look at the P and L because it moves so fast, you know, and, and like I said, man, that once you start going down, like once the P and L starts trending down, you don't trade the same, you know? So that, again, I, I know like I could draw, I could, it's like beating a dead horse. You can say it a hundred times, but I, you know, I still struggle with, it. I just did it not too long ago, but um, yeah. Yeah. You, you also said something about it's one mistake that leads into multiple. And, and I want you to elaborate on that because I'm, I agree with you first off on everything you said, especially on PN, I don't look at PNL at all. And same thing when I do though, occasionally, cause I'm human, like occasionally I yeah. do, I'm telling you when I do, I'm a, I'm not even me anymore. <laughs> I'm like, I'll just make all the mistakes in the world. So I know yeah. what you mean. And, and some people could look at it all day and trade it. I just can't. And it seems like you're similar like me. Let me ask you this then. Can you explain a little bit more? And I, I would like you to explain this on how one bad mistake can lead to other mistakes. And you mentioned how instead of adding on dips, you're selling on dips and vice versa. Well, it just goes back to the point of, you know, you're, you're giving back you're giving back money, you know? So you're not thinking clearly anymore. You're not looking at the chart. You're looking at the P and L and all of a sudden you want to get out and you want to salvage whatever's left, you know, of that P and L and you could get taken out or, you know, if the dip's too big, you know, instead of buying in the washouts, you're just selling into it because, you know, the next big washout that comes, because after the first big one, you know, that it's probably most, most likely you're going to fail. And then that next one, you know, you're digging deeper in your P and L and you just, again, it's, it's just, it's bad decision-making but strictly seeing off of seeing that number, you know, and, and that's why I like, especially day trading, man, it's just, it's best just not to look and just focus on, that's why I love that trader, you know, and, and uh, yes. you, you could see like where you bought, you could see where you sold and in intraday. So I trade uh, like week opens or I, I trade like stuff that, that gaps down. Like I'll set my, uh, my trend lines, my um, excuse me, the resistance points. Like I'll scroll back, even if it takes like 10, 15 days, like, because in DAS, you can scroll back, like, I think a month and I'll draw my lines and I'll just trade with my support and resistance, you know, and if it gets there, I know I'm selling into it. If it fails, you know, I'm, I'm moving out of it, but, um, man, that's just, that's messed me up so many times, but you know, regardless, you know what your P and L is. Cause if you know, you're familiar with your, with your size and you know what you're doing, it's like, it's kind of hard to, to ignore, but you just got to fight that urge. <laughs> Yeah, you really do because you'll you'll just become a whole different trader, like, and you'll just be yeah. scared. I love what you said because it positions you instead of seeing you're that you're up sixty grand, like you said earlier, you feel like you're down forty, which is just it's beautifully put. It's it's a hundred percent true, and, and you're really up at the end of the day. Like you're you're right. really up. yeah, you bought down yeah. there, buddy. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, let, what is something that before we start to wrap this up because we're getting close on time, but I I want to ask you a couple more things, and that is. What's something that you wish someone would have told you when you first started? So that way you didn't lose that, you know, six, you lost in the first six months, like half of the, that big gain that you got from the company. So what do you wish you would have learned or someone would have told you so that way that wouldn't have happened? Man, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hit the cliche here. <laughs> I have to. So I, one thing I wish I didn't do was just be solely focused on the money. Cause that's all I cared about when I, <clears throat> when I started that messed me up more than anything. You know, I, I went in and I was like, you know, I made this X amount of money, which I really didn't, you know, it was the, the options were granted to me. I, I didn't trade it. And so I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I went in and, you know, I was like, I, I want to make whatever back then, like 500 bucks or, you know, my goal, my ultimate goal was like, just make a grand a day. And I had this like whiteboard, which I still do. Like I write everything down. 
I was like, I want to make a thousand dollars a day. How, you know, it's like you put this, this predetermined expectation on a totally arbitrary set of rules and you expect to come out and make money every single day. You know, and at the time I wasn't worried about, like, it wasn't even focused on the how it was like the end result. Like I just want to get here. And I never spent the, the quality time on that first go at it, figuring out how do I actually trade? I remember my first trade, I was like a deer in headlights. I didn't even think I knew like which side of the, of the level two I was executing on, you know, but all I was focused on was like, Hey, this guy made X amount. Like this guy made this, <clears throat> you see it all the time, you know? And instead of focusing on what am I doing? How do I like, how do I place a trade? I was doing the exact opposite, you know, as I do now, it's like things run up, you buy and then slams. Then I sell. I mean, it, that's just how it was. And I, I did it time and time again. And I was so focused on the money. I was so focused on the end result and, you know, me having to go back to, to get a real job, you know, it was like, okay, well this clearly didn't work, but I, you know, I, obviously I didn't walk away from it. I just had to change my approach. Yep. And then I came back and then I was just obsessed about how do I figure out this process? How do I cultivate my own process? Because whether, you know, you're in a room or, you know, you're getting some newsletter alert or you're subscribed to some, you know, uh, whatever people are doing nowadays, at the end of the day, you're not going to have conviction to hold, yep. you know, just because somebody's telling you, Hey, like, this is a good play. So you have to, at the end, you have to have your own process. And I, I understand building a baseline and understanding technicals and learning that stuff, but without your own conviction and without your own process, we are your own tweaks. Yep. You're never going to make it because following somebody else's rules or, you know, we, like I can't, we can't trade the same because I trade with a much bigger range. I trade totally different things. Somebody can't just jump in and follow what I do. Somebody can follow and jump in what you do. You know, everybody has to have their own approach unless you tweak it and you start building that over time, man, that's, that'll cultivate the long run. And I'm telling you like guys that come in and I think they're going to make money in six months to a year. I mean, if you do, you're a, you're getting pretty lucky, like people jumping into markets in the last couple of months. And that's, that shit's not going to last. You know, it took me a good couple of years to really like yes. have a little bit of consistency. But once I, once I figured out, Hey, like I'm making progress, like I just like slowly built up on it and it, it comes, man. I mean, I've seen so many examples of it and like this, this definitely is, you know, far from like to get rich quick, because, you know, if you make it quick, you're going to lose it quick too in the markets. And that's all I'm going to say. I know it's the biggest cliche, but I, no, I love it. I love it because you hit so many good things. You hit number one, like don't focus on the money because I'll be the trader. We're all about process over profit, just process. It's all that matters. Executing well. When you execute well, Paso, you do well. That's at the end of the day. Number two, you also mentioned that if you're in a room, however you learn your baseline, that's cool. But at the same time, like you're not ever going to have the conviction to actually be in a trade that someone else tells you about or that you hear from someone else. And you won't, and, and you won't have confidence to, you might get shaken out. You might get, you might take a little gains, but at the end of the day, you're not going to be self-sufficient, right? You're not going to be able to do it on your own. And I love what you said. You and I, you compared to us, like, you know, I couldn't trade like you, you couldn't trade like me. It's because at the end of the day, we all trade, dude, at the end of the day, we all trade different. Like we Absolutely. all trade different. And that's what I want everyone to listen to. Like we all it trade different. We've had what hundreds of people on the show now, or I don't know if it's hundreds, but tons of traders on the show, and every single one trades completely different from the other. And we could trade the same ticker. I'm sure we've traded the same ticker, yeah. and I'm sure we've yeah. taken two different positions. And I'm right. sure that we both were right <laughs> in our time frame. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like yeah. it happens all the time. And that is something that you highlighted very good. And I appreciate you saying that. Well, is there man. any is there any book that you have ever if, if you haven't read any books about trading that's cool but if there's any book regardless if it's trading related or not that's something that helped you through this journey could you let me let the audience know like what book that might have been if there was one uh you know i'm like the most dyslexic person ever <laughs> like i didn't good. find this out until law school and i'm like man i can't read like these words are like jumble you know but i'm a very visual person i'm good at math but i will say like you know the the charting like journaling your trades not just writing them down but you know taking screenshots camtasia is a great tool you can record your trades 
And if you, I mean, it's like game film, you know, like you want to yes. be good, you know, record your plays and rewatch it on the weekends. And like, I make notes, man, I still do to this day. And, you know, I'm seven years in, you know, I, I still track my stuff, you know, cause I'm trying to still like keep my edge, you know? So that's the best tool that you got I me mean, with this technology. Now, like you got everything at your fingertips. You just need you and, and trade and screen time. Dude. Oh. Amen, brother. You know, I, I actually shared this uh, on my solo episode. I record my screen. I used to do it every day by myself for myself. And yeah. I would rewatch it just like games. You know, you rewatch the tape and you can see how you trade it from a yeah. different perspective. And yeah. you can really see things that you couldn't see when you're in the moment. Did yep. you record your trades for swing trading too that way? Or, no, or no, no. okay, just okay, okay. Just cool. That makes yeah. sense because I do it for day yeah. trading. Um, yeah. man, you just dropped some cool stuff, man. And and <laughs> it's it's called Camtasia, is what you used, right? Camtasia, yeah, yeah. Okay, and that's a recording software. I'm guessing it's just a recording software, yeah. Okay, then yeah. if anyone's listening, it's called Camtasia, and also I use OBS. You can and then Windows has its own Windows recorder. You could also use you can use yeah. anything, just you want to watch. And if, I don't know if you did this, Paso, but I, I recorded my thoughts out loud for myself. So mm. while I was in the trade to say, I'm nervous right now, because I was in a different state. I don't know when you did it. I, yeah, yeah. I did it to find consistency. It helped me. Yeah. And I was like, man, I'm nervous right now. And I would pick up on things that I would say before I lose, right? before I made a wrong decision. And I was like, after I watched, you know, I'd recorded three or four months straight and yeah. I would watch them all. I don't do it now, to be honest. But I would be like, yo, when I say these things, I need to be aware. Yeah. That's cool. Did anything so stick out I'll, like that I'll, for you? I'll drop a little, little bit, little like nugget here. Um, so something Nate showed me was doing the time and sales, doing two different ones. So one you do, and I've done this before where like I'll place, you know, names are very liquid, you know, a couple million shares and up. You know, you see a lot of these prints go through. So I used to see, or I used to set them just, just above to show prints above a thousand. So now I have two time and sale sheets, one that shows all of them and the other one that shows just a thousand and above. And if you, if you record and if you watch your, your uh, trades back again, see where things break down and see where the things, where things break out and watch what happens with level two, because you'll see that shift over time, you know, with screen time, you get to learn, you know, and it becomes very natural, like an instinct, you see it and then, you know, you press it. But if you get to go back and see it again, Watch when things break out or watch when things break down and go back and review that review that film and just you'll start to pick up on things. So just one little piece of. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, man. You know, you're in this on a good note and I appreciate you so much. Let me ask you this. Where can people find you or if they ever want to reach out or just just see where you're at? What's the best? Yeah, way I'm on Twitter. P Millie 90 uh, P M I L L Y 90 P Millie. Perfect. Well, P Millie. Paso, thank you for being here, man. Thank course, you for man. dropping some great knowledge. And man, it's it's been fun, dude. And what's, oh, yeah. you know, what's crazy is we're both from Dallas, which is freaking <laughs> crazy. It's just wild. The, so the recent apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> we have done in the house. So I know we'll connect sometime in the future. And I know we'll bring you back on the show, man, because this is a good appreciate time. It, man. So I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you.